Hey y'all, this is Dr. Carmen Corder with TheDoctorNurse.com and in this video I want to kind of continue with our endocrine discussion whereas last week we discussed DKA. Well this week I want to talk about DKA's counterpart if you will. It is called hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome or some of you may know it as hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketosis. It's all the same thing. So let's jump right in and talk about HHS or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. So you know when I talk about the patho we always start off with the etiology and type 2 diabetics get HHS whereas DKA is the emergency complication of our type 1 diabetics. HHS is our emergency complication for our type 2 diabetics. So you have a type 2 diabetic either diagnosed or undiagnosed and some kind of stress happens to them and just like with DKA most often it's an illness, a physical illness. <coughs> it could be psychological stress, it could be emotional stress, the loss of a loved one, it could be some type of surgery. But most often the stress that throws them, that throws these diabetics into these emergency situations is some sort of physical illness like the flu or a stomach virus. And so we all know that under conditions of stress, stress hormones are released. The big three players of the stress hormones are our fight or flight, which is epi and norepi, and also cortisol. Cortisol is released to fight inflammation in situations of stress, and cortisol, epi, and norepi all oppose insulin. So if you have these stress hormones that are being released that oppose insulin, obviously that is going to make blood glucose increase but in a type 2 diabetic, these people have a resistance to insulin. So it's going to cause massive havoc with these patients. Now with DKA, with our type 1 diabetics, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder where the beta cells of the pancreas are attacked and they're not able to produce insulin. With type 2 diabetes, the etiology of type 2 diabetes are several things combined, okay? Obesity, sedentary lifestyle, just um, the types of foods that people choose to eat, um, high blood pressure, people with heart disease, all of those things can combine to increase someone's risk for type 2 diabetes. And over time, mainly obesity and sedentary lifestyle cause these patients to become resistant to the insulin within their body. Alright, so with type 2 diabetes you have an insulin resistance as opposed to an insulin deficiency. So with that stress, the release of the stress hormones and the insulin resistance that type 2 diabetics have, it results in extreme hyperglycemia. And I have hyperglycemia kind of highlighted here because the blood glucose of someone with HHS is most likely going to be much, much, much higher than a patient that comes in with DKA. And there are several reasons for that. Type 1 diabetes usually develops in childhood. Well, it doesn't develop in childhood. It does develop in childhood and is usually recognized and diagnosed early in childhood. Therefore, these patients grow up knowing with their knowing their diagnosis, knowing how their body feels when their blood sugar goes up, when their blood sugar goes down. They know what to do to treat it. They know that when they get the stomach virus or the flu or whatever, they're probably going to need extra doses of insulin. So our type 1 diabetics for the most part are very informed. They, none, they know what's going on with their bodies because they're diagnosed very early in life. However, our type 2 diabetics, <coughs> the signs and symptoms with type 2 diabetes are much, much more subtle than with type 1 diabetes. 
So literally someone could be walking around with type 2 diabetes and not know it for years and years and years and remain undiagnosed. And they just brush off their fatigue or their thirst or their, you know, excessive urination as part of the aging process or something like that. And they have no idea that they're a type 2 diabetic. So when something like this happens to someone, especially who is undiagnosed, um, they prolong seeking treatment. Whereas when our type 1 diabetic, they, they know. They know they've got to go in because something is very wrong with their body. They're sick and they probably know they're going into DKA. Not so much the case with our type 2 diabetics, right? They don't seek treatment early because oftentimes they're undiagnosed diabetics. Even if they are diagnosed diabetics, the signs and symptoms of their hyperglycemia, even though they are the same, they're much more subtle than with a type 1 diabetic. And again, with our hyperglycemia, the signs and symptoms are going to be the three P's. Polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. And just a real quick kind of recap about what those are. So the polyphagia is, the, is caused by cellular starvation. It's where the patient feels very hungry. So, you know, without the insulin to unlock the doors to the cells of the adipose tissue, the muscle cells, the liver cells, those cells are unable to be fed because of the insulin resistance. And that leads to a sense of hunger. And that is the polyphagia. The polyuria again is osmotic diuresis <clears throat> and with these folks the blood glucose can go up to like 1500 I mean like unreal high numbers of blood glucose so osmotic diuresis results in the body's attempt to rid itself of all that extra glucose and return the body to a normal serum osmolality and then the polydipsia obviously is the body's way of saying hey we need to dilute some of this glucose out because serum osmolality is so high. So the patient feels very thirsty. On top of that, they're going to feel very thirsty because of the extreme osmotic diuresis that accompanies um, HHS. And I feel like I need to mention that what kills our HHS patients is hypovolemia. All right, whereas with DKA, you've always got to be on the lookout for that potassium level, right? Um, but with HHS, it is hypovolemia that is most concerning for the nurse because the osmotic diuresis is so great because the blood glucose is so high. So these patients, they're going to urinate and urinate and urinate and urinate. And so you've got to watch out for hypovolemia and hypovolemic shock. So fluids are the number one priority for our patients with HHS. So get those IV fluids started, then we'll get them started on the insulin drip and start getting that blood glucose down. So some of the things that you're going to see, the three P's, <coughs> for example, are going to be the same as the stuff that you see with the DKA patients, but what you're not going to see is you're not going to see the ketone urea where the ketones are in the urine. Um, you're not going to see the acidosis, probably not the same GI signs and symptoms because our DKA patients will often have nausea and vomiting that accompany the acidosis that goes along with DKA. Also, the potassium is not going to be as huge of a concern with HHS, um, it will be now when we start the insulin drip, all right, but they're not going to come in with a high potassium. Uh, but when we start that insulin drip, we're definitely, definitely, definitely going to need to watch for a low potassium. So anytime anyone is on continuous IV insulin, you've got to watch that potassium level because it can and will drop. But our main concern with HHS is actually going to be hypovolemia. That's what's going to kill these patients because of the extreme osmotic diuresis. 
and that is HHS or HHNK, whatever your program calls it. In a nutshell, I hope this has helped you. Look out for the Endocrine Pathopedia coming out very, very soon. Thanks so, so much for watching. If you're watching this from YouTube, hit that subscribe button if you like what you see. If you're not watching it from YouTube, head over to thedrnurse.com and there's tons of other videos, other resources. The Pathopedia eBooks for CV, respiratory, GI, and GU are now out and available to purchase. And I promise you will not regret purchasing those books. And again, just thank you so much for watching and thank you for being a part of the Dr. Nurse community.